There we go. We're going to start recording our meeting. So it is recorded. Um, but welcome. Welcome to the first uh, the first meeting of the new year. Can't believe it's 2022. <laughs> it just keeps going by so quickly. Um, we're so glad that you could be here and join us uh, for the Big Valley Beekeepers Guild on our first meeting of the year. Um, so just as a reminder, um, please mute yourself. Um, video is fine. Um, it's a great way to socialize. And uh, we're glad that you're here. We're going to start our presentation now, and then we'll um, we um, will wrap up between 7:45 and 8 o'clock, um, just depending on how many questions people have. But we're really excited, and we're glad that you're here and joining us. And and make sure to share how you heard about us. So that is always a um, always a great thing to learn. We have a couple of updates. Um, some exciting things actually. Uh, when it comes to um, our beekeeping guild. So the first thing is, it is time to renew your membership, um, but we are, um, we are going to post new links um, in the next week or so. So look for those new links. You'll be able to renew your membership for 2022. The membership fee is $20 per year uh, for individual and for dual, which is two people in the same household. Uh, it's $30 per calendar year. So we appreciate your support. And that ends up being less than like $2 a month to get all this great beekeeping information and to connect with other local beekeepers. So, um, so please consider joining us for this year. And again, we'll be having, we'll get those new links out very shortly. Um, other exciting news is we have an opportunity this year to actually have um, if you need bees, we're actually going to, going to be working with Eric Oliver to supply bees um, to our local area. So you don't have to drive up all the way to Grass Valley to get your bees. Um, we're going to have a limited number. We're going to um, we're placing a pre-order of 20 nukes. Um, and these are from the, um, the Oliver uh, apiary, which is very well known and highly reputable and has some fantastic high quality nukes and bees. Um, when you reserve your nuke, um, there, there are no refunds. So once you reserve it, it's, it's yours. Um, you can always find someone else to buy it from you um, if needed, if you can't take it for some reason. And the date to be is to be announced. So once the nukes are available, which won't be until April or early May, um, once we get that word from Eric Oliver that they're ready, uh, we'll let you know and you'll have a location locally in the Lodi vicinity. Um, Lodi Galt vicinity, um, you'll, you'll get uh, notified that there's a day and a time to come pick those up. So again, we only have a limited number of 20. Uh, we expect that those mm -hmm. will probably sell out, especially after our beginners beekeepers class. And we'll, be, um, we'll have the links for those um, as well. So coming up in the next, next week or so. Um, so just to give you that heads up, we're also, um, we're doing our first ever beginning beekeepers class, <laughs> which is amazing. So we are so thrilled and excited to be able to do this. Um, it's going to be March 5th, which is a Saturday. It's going to be most of the day, probably something like from nine to three, nine to 4 PM. Um, and it's going to include both a, um, a classroom workshop, which is being held on March 5th and a field day at a local apiary. So that day is gonna be announced depending on weather, probably will take place in April, but, um, but we're, we're gonna get ready to allow people to register for that too, as well. We're gonna keep the cost um, kind of reasonable this year. I think we talked about um, around $65 and that includes uh, membership in your guild. So, um, so look forward to that or help us spread the word when we get the links out, we'd really appreciate it. Um, limited seating on that as well, but we definitely want to fill, fill the seats. Um, some other news. So we are recruiting a director. We recently had um, both uh, Dan Lawrence and Michael Olson are retire officially from their director roles, and um, but we're still roping, in, roping them in to help us. So they're going to help us uh, with the be beginning beekeepers workshop <laughs> on March 5th. Um, but we'd like to welcome Dave Marson, who is our um, newest director to the board. And we also are still recruiting to fill one more position. So, um, so if you're interested in volunteering or getting involved with the Guild and where we're going from here, please absolutely um, email us, let us know. Something else 
which is super exciting, is we are partnering with the Lodi Chamber of Commerce and their weekly farmers markets that happen during the summer. These markets run every Thursday night and they start in May and they go through August. And August 5th will be officially their last, last farmers market for this year. We are, they're actually um, going to have themed farmers market nights. And this year they're going to have one that's dedicated to bees. So bees, beekeeping, everything honey related. We're going to put together um, some honey tastings and our guild members, our actual um, paid members will have, an, have the opportunity um, to not only participate in that, but possibly have a booth um, to sell their honey or to sell their wares, their different um, beekeeping um, uh, supplies. So keep a, keep a lookout on for that as well coming up. And then just a reminder, we do have a private Facebook page. That's where we have a lot of dialogue in between the monthly meetings. And, um, and it's a great way to learn about our meetings, get the links, all that good stuff. Um, so make sure, you know, if you haven't already gotten onto that five, private Facebook page and you're on Facebook, you know, please let us know and we'll help you find it. So, all right. Um, let's see, Dave or Paul or Mark, anything to add to our announcements? I don't have anything. All right, very good. Well, just before we get started, um, we want to thank Barbara um, Cortapasi, who actually is the sponsor this month of our Zoom meeting fees. So thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, if you would like to sponsor a meeting, it's only $15, and that pays for our, um, our Zoom fees, which we're, um, which we're excited to always help, help have help with that. So thank you to Barbara. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and turn it over to, let's see, oh, there we go. Turn it over to Paul Lockhart. And tonight's subject, we're gonna talk all about January beekeeping, um, especially here in the Valley. Um, we, I don't know about you guys, but this weather this last week has been fantastic. It feels really warm. The bees are definitely out. I can see them everywhere, um, but it can be kind of misleading. So we're really gonna talk about um, what do, what do we need to watch for? How do we know if our hives are active? How do we know that they've survived the winter? And uh, what does that need to look like? So with that, we're gonna turn it over to Paul. <clears throat> well, hello everybody. Um, <laughs> I wanna start by saying I am, I, I consider myself, I'm, I, I'm not a 20 year beekeeper. I'm, I'm not a beginner beekeeper. I'm somewhere in the middle. I don't know everything, even though sometimes I act like it. So, you know, be patient, bear with me. Uh, you know, if I say something that's just way out there, feel free to let me know. Um, if you feel like you have something to add or contribute, you're welcome to do that. So uh, let's get started. There you go. Oh, and, so, and Paul, Paul, can I remind everybody if they want, um, definitely, you know, um, they can put their questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring for that. Um, but we'll also ask her questions at the end of the presentation too, if people want to unmute themselves. So thank you yeah. so much. Take it away. And, and, and I'm not the only one that can answer questions. So if somebody asks a question and you have a wonderful answer, uh, feel free. It, this is a uh, forum. So, but, okay. So the first slide, um, I just want you to show you guys generally what happens throughout the year. So if you look at this slide, um, our coldest month temperature wise is uh, December and January. So um, the bees in these cold months are, there's, there's not a, a lot of activity. <laughs> but with this weather lately, they made a complete liar out of me, but the things are, are getting interesting. But uh, typically it's, it's cold in December. Um, December is usually a little bit colder than January. So Right now in January, the temperatures are starting to creep up. So as temperatures creep up, your hives are going to become more and more active. The other thing that contributes to hive activity is the number of daylight hours. Um, so if you look in, at the yellow bars here, um, the winter solstice was December 21st, which is the shortest day of the year. So now we're on the other side of that. So the days are starting to get longer and longer. So as you get more daylight hours, the bees become more active. Uh, rainfall 
January and December. So obviously if it's raining, the bees aren't gonna be out flying around. So, you know, there's, there's several factors. There's temperature, there's uh, daylight hours, there's rainfall, um, rainfall days. So you get the most rainfall higher. So there's a lot that happens right now that, that uh, causes the bees to want to stay inside, except with the exception of the current weather we're having right now, it kind of, None of that is true. Um, so when bees go through winter, they cluster inside of the hive to stay warm. They do not heat the entire space inside the hive. They, they cluster together in a ball and create heat. And that's how they stay warm during the winter. This, is, this comes from Randy Oliver's website. Uh, he talks about, there's a couple of quotes from him. Um, Least efficient wintering occurs between 50 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which pretty much describes the weather we're having now. Um, it's not quite warm enough to forage, which my bees are foraging. Um, it's not quite cold enough to form a tight cluster. Basically, what's going on is the bees are um, they're active. You know, they're, they're active during the day out trying to forage, and then at night. They're, they're active, you know, trying to stay warm and create heat for the hive. So right now, because of the nice weather we're having, they're actually burning a ton of energy and burning energy means they're gonna go through their stores much faster. Uh, this talks a little bit about the cluster in the hive. It shows that, you know, when they cluster for warmth, there's a core, and then as you get further and further away from that core, temperatures get, they drop lower and lower. The queen will be found in the middle of this cluster, and that's where you'll also find any brood on the frames. Um, they cluster, create heat, bring brood. Kind of a the cluster of bees. Um, shows that you know the other the rest of the space in the hive sometimes can be as cold as ambient it's not necessarily the same temperature as the the cluster um so i just i put that in there just so people understand how bees heat the hive they they create these clusters and vibrate their flight muscles to create heat hey and paul, so this is, paul yes. with the, with the heat a lot of people think that the whole inside of the hive is heated is that right no, no, it's the, the cluster, <laughs> it's the cluster itself is, is heated. It's heated. The, um, right. The rest of the space, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, any heat that radiates off that cluster will Dissipate. contribute towards the, the temperature inside. But yeah, that they're, they're not trying to heat, you know, it's not like your mom yelling at you to close the front door because you're letting all the heat out. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> They, they don't try to heat the entire space. You can imagine if, if they did, how quickly they would bring through all their stores, how much energy. They... Goal is to keep that cluster warm. Um, so the whole point of this talk was to talk about um, what, how do you manage your hives in January? And this little excerpt comes from um, UC Davis El Nino Bee Lab. And per their recommendation, they say if, if you're a first year beekeeper, which I'm assuming means you don't have bees yet, um, make sure you read and take a lot of classes, um, get, get educate yourself. You know, so when the time comes, you have some idea. Purchased your equipment, you've ordered your packages. Um, if you if you don't have bees right now, and you plan on having bees. Them. You're late. Paul, can you say that one more time? I think you cut out you cut out you, just a tab right there on that last sentence. So find some of will be um, offering some some new books from Randy or Eric all over. But to, uh, you 
now, now is the time to, to order your packages and your nukes. Paul, I think we're, I, oh, I think, oh, uh oh, we might have just lost Paul. <laughs> I think, let's see if he's still here. Um, oh, he might have just gotten kicked off. That's what happens sometimes. So here, let me pull up his presentation while he gets back in. There we go. I'll share my screen. Um, there we go. Was that distorted? Everyone did it. What was the last thing everybody heard Paul say? I'm not even sure if I could even, if I even know, just basically it was about being late on something and about ordering your package of bees, but I don't know what he was okay. trying to say. All right, got okay. it. Can you just hear me again? Oh, there we go. There's Paul. Yes. All right, let's try this again. Okay. We I'm just- we, of that. You're a little bit distorted, but not too bad. But I think we missed the last, let's see. You were on slide number nine, I think, or 10. And we, we missed, we, we just heard the very first part of that one. There you go. This is on my right slide. Sorry, see that again? You got a little distorted again. Oh no, I think we might've lost them again too. All right, let's pull this up. Okay. Let's see here. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Very good. So let's see if some, we'll watch for Paul to come back. Can you hear me now? Oh, there we go. I can hear you. I've shared, um, you... I'm, I'm sharing your screen. Do you want me to go ahead and okay. advance for you? Okay. Yes. Okay. We missed part of this, um, what you said about this slide and when to order the nukes, I think. Well, I was just saying, if you haven't done it already, you should do it now. Um, they, people, okay. a lot of these suppliers, especially the good ones, sell out pretty quickly. So you want to get in and, and get your nukes, queens, whatever it is you're going to need ordered. Got it. Got it. Got it. All right. I just have myself. Oh, here you go. I just advanced to the next screen. Did you, do you see it? Yes. Okay, great, 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 great. I'm giving myself priority on my home network, so. Uh, oh, okay, if, good if deal. You hear some, <laughs> if you hear some screaming, people are going to be. Yeah. <laughs> um, people in your household will be concerned about where the web, the web strength is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's too funny. Um, well, so oh, January. Oh yeah, go for it. Um, when the weather is warm and sunny, your hive is in good, and your hive is in good health. You should observe a lot of activities such as orientation flights, cleansing flights, foragers returning the hive with pollen. Um, you should all be seeing that right now. If, if you're not seeing that, you should be a little bit worried. Uh, I'm not saying it's the end of the world, but uh, you, if you're not seeing that, then it, you know, it's time to get in that hive and, and see what's going on. Um, if it looks like everything's healthy, you know, lots of activity, um, you are probably okay. Um, you can still, you know, because of the weather right now is so nice, it's so warm, you can, you know, it doesn't hurt to get in there. You, you, you should have some idea how much food they had going into winter. Uh, if they didn't have a lot and you know, it looks busy, you know, I might be tempted to open it up and take a look. Um, if and when you do open it, don't stay in the hive for very long because you can chill any brood. And uh, here in California, the bees never stop producing brood. It's, we don't get that cold. So there's going to be brood in there the whole time. So um, if you go in, you know, know what you're going in for. If, if you're checking for food, 
um, you're going to go to straight to those frames where there should you should see food and you're going to check those if you're looking for brood go straight to the frames that have brood um, just be careful not to roll your queen or harm any bees um, If you're not seeing what appears to be an active, healthy hive, then most likely your hive has issues and you will need to intervene. Is this, Sheree, is this the slide that I sent you? Or the, the presentation I sent you? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. <laughs> so what, um, I, what we're saying yes. is as far as the presentation, yeah. okay. Because yeah. I did add something to this section. So the other thing, oh. um, you should all have reducers on your hives right now, entrance reducers. You know, there should be a very small space. And sometimes what happens is when the bees die inside the hive, they pile up behind that reducer and you don't see them. Um, one thing you can do is take that reducer out, you know, create like a metal hook, not, a, a clothes hanger might work, you know, something you can get in there and kind of drag those bees, the dead bees out and just kind of help the bees, you know, keep their hive clean. Um, if you see a ton of dead bees, again, there, there may be an issue. Um, if Uh-oh, Paul, <laughs> say that last sentence again. Hey Sheree, what we what we might do is uh, have Paul maybe just call in, and then you would control the say switch. Yeah, switch to dial in. That, that might fix that whole problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, not well, not dial in, but like have him call, and then we can just have Sheree just move the slides uh, for him. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, let's see. Would um would somebody mind reach? Uh, let's see, Mark. I will. Do you I mind? will text him. Oh, okay. All right, great, thank you. All right, we'll get that going. Let's see. I think he's trying to dial back in. All right. Okay, this is getting a little ridiculous, but I'll- Oh, <clears throat> there you are, hey, Paul. I'll try, try, hey, I'll hey, try Paul, John. If, yeah, if you want to, Paul, if you wanted to call in and then just have Sheree control the slides, has an idea. Uh, up to you. That I mean, like that. Uh, that way, you just have you just start using your phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that might be a good idea. A good idea. Okay. There go. Well, it, I think my internet, whether it's I don't know if it's the audio that's that's making it go in and out or the, everything. Oh, maybe. Well, no matter what, we can. Um, anyway, if you're, that's, yeah. That's, we can. Yeah, you keep we on going, and then if you drop off again, just go ahead and um, and you can call in. So. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I put this in here. There's, it's a little book. It's called At the Hive Entrance. It's kind of an older. I, I don't know if I'd call it a book. It's a little pamphlet, or you know, it's, I think it's like sixty or seventy pages, but it's kind of interesting. Um, and the whole premise is that you can tell a lot about what's going on inside the hive just by watching the entrance. Um, I don't want to go into a ton of details. Some of the, some of the stuff there, you kind of look at it, and it's kind of like I don't know, the way it's written is kind of strange, but it's it's kind of interesting. But generally, the premise is that you can tell a lot about what's going on in, at, inside the hive by watching the outside. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> there we go. Paul, are you still there? All right, well, while Paul gets on with us again, <laughs> I'll go ahead and talk about this slide because this was, this was good timing. So um, one of the things that you can do if you are trying to uh, figure out what's going on inside of your hive without having to actually crack it open and do an inspection, right? Because just, just like Paul mentioned earlier, Right now, we're really constrained constrained by by weather and by 
by outdoor temperatures. And if it's too cold, there's really, you don't wanna keep that hive open for long. So something that you can actually use is called a fluor, I call it fluor <laughs> camera. Um, they run about $200, um, so they're great um, as a Christmas present. <laughs> Uh, but what's so cool is it uses infrared and they make a camera that you can actually hook onto your um, Android or iPhone um, and then take pictures. And the pictures have all different types of settings. But what's neat is that you can actually, it'll actually provide you with some heat sensor um, activity as, as far as what's going on inside the hive. You have to play around with it. And one of the tips that I've heard is that you um, you basically want to do it when it's dark outside or if there's, you know, the sun has not shown and then heated up the wood of the, of the hive boxes. So you want to do it on a completely cloudy day. Um, but it's amazing because it will actually give you a view without actually opening up the hive to see because of the heat signatures to actually see where your colony is clustered. Does anybody else um, have one of these by chance? You can unmute yourself if you want. No, but a cheap version of that is a ten fifteen dollar uh, infrared thermometer. Oh yes. So you're basically just pointing that little red laser mm -hmm. at uh, different surfaces, and you can move it left and right. You can see any kind of temperature difference. Any changes? You know, I have not had good, very good luck with those temperature heat sensor reading thingy majiggies, but the floor camera is pretty cool. Um, and it's, um, it, you just have to kind of get used to the settings. And obviously if the, if the hive's already been heated cause it's in the sun, even if it's still cold outside, it's still going to pick up some of that heat. So it'll give you a, a different type of reading, but super kind of cool how technology can help us these days figure out what's going on before, you know, without even having to open the hive. So, all right. Okay. Oh, there's, there's Paul. Are you back? Can you hear us okay? <laughs> oh, are you still there? There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll go ahead while Paul's getting Paul's getting a I signal. I am oh, kind of. I kind are you of, there? Can you oh, there you are. Okay, I can hear you now. All right. Oh, are you there now? Oh, we can't hear Paul. Well, so so here are some of the typical issues that you might see during the winter months, right? Or during January. Um, and one of them could be deformed wings and other kinds of diseases and viruses. The reason for this is often because your mite loads just are just too high. Um, and this is what we're always chasing, right? We're trying to get to a point where we have manageable mite load numbers, um, especially going into the fall months and then going into the winter. And we know because of the reproductive cycle of, of the mites, of the varroa mites, that you know as the number of bees are increasing through the spring, they kind of pivot out at, you know, in the summertime where, where now you have the highest mite count you might ever have. And then your bee numbers begin to dwindle. The queen doesn't lay quite as much because of the weather's changing. So as that happens, the, the mites obviously are still reproducing. So you end up with really high mite, mite counts, and but your bee number is dwindling and the mites will outnumber the bees. So going into winter, if you haven't treated, if you haven't monitored that, because um, ideally you want to get those mite numbers down as low as you possibly can going into those winter months. And, um, and then once you're in those winter months, if there are still high mite loads, um, that's what causes those deformed wings and other kinds of viruses. So that could be an issue. And it might not be something that you recognize as an issue until literally you start to open up your hive in the spring and realize that's what you're seeing. Um, another possible typical issue could be the lack of food stores. And that's why, you know, does anybody remember how many frames do they usually recommend for you to have frames of honey that you have in your hive per box? Anyone, anyone? <laughs> I believe it's usually, um, I think it's four to six frames of honey per, per box, 
brew box. Um, and so you want to make sure that you have that or if you're recognizing that your bees can actually get to their feed and and utilize it. A lot of times we'll think that, oh my gosh, they have plenty of frames of, of honey up in the second brew box, but come to find out the colony was so small, they, you know, they weren't able to utilize it to get up there to where the honey was and then heat it so that they can actually utilize it. So the other thing to watch for is um, excessive moisture in the hive. So what are some signs of that? Has anybody ever opened up their hive in the spring and found maybe mold or any, any kind of moisture spots? No? I'm not seeing any of you. Yes or no? I'm watching the videos too. <laughs> I know for myself, so um, I have a couple of, um, couple of the colonies that on the very top, of the inner cover, there's always moisture and mold in one specific corner, and that must be the low point. Um, and I have tried um, using quilt boxes, that kind of thing, or moisture boxes, and but in my area, for whatever reason, they just they end up not being that useful. So, Paul, are you back on by chance? I can you hear me? Oh yes, we can hear you now. Uh, there okay. you go. So I'm trying this through my phone and. Okay on the computer at the same time. Oh, so. okay, got it. So here we go. So we talked a little bit about, you know, mite loads going into the fall and the winter months and how that can cause deformed wings and viruses. We talked a little bit about the lack of food stores and how you have to watch for that because you definitely don't want your bees to starve. And then of course, excessive moisture. So if you want to add to those, any any specific points? We didn't get did to you, the feeling. Did you, did, did you go to the next, the deformed wings and up, you went through that mm -hmm. slide already? Yep, we're on that side, yeah. Lack of food stores, we're on failing queen. Right now. So um, failing queen, it's one of those things, it happens when mm -hmm. it happens. There's just not a whole lot you can do about it unless you have other hives. Um, I started something this year that I have never done before. I, I'm keeping, nucleus colonies and uh, I have two going right now so if something happens come spring I need another queen I'm just going to pop the queen out of that nucleus colony and, and uh, put her in the, the big hive and keep that hive going and um, hopefully by then you know when the other hive the nuke needs a new queen I can either buy another one or just let, the, let it requeen itself but uh, mm. um, it happens I just happened to me you get to, to you know before you you get to a point in the spring where queens are available, uh, your, your queen, you lose it. And there's not a whole lot you can do. You just kind of hope that they, they make it into the, the, the spring when you can replace her. Um, hopefully everybody's keeping notes, good notes on uh, their hives, you know, when they, they purchase or, or you know, what are just the general history of that hive if you catch a swarm you know write down the date you caught it uh, where you caught it and uh, some so that you have some idea of how old the queen is um, and I that's one thing I'm not good at that I need to get better at is replacing queens on a regular basis I always wait until they fail and you know sometimes by then it's too late um, so one thing I, I'm trying to work on is, is being more proactive in, in replacing queens. Um, Good deal. Paul, so there, so I see here where there are slides, because I'm advancing through them, um, mm -hmm. that kind of go into more of a description about the feeling queens. Let's see. And then, um, and then also about the moisture boxes, that kind of thing. Do you want to talk about those slides at all? Do you want me to back up? Um, go back to number two. Let's okay. see. This one? Uh, about one lack more. of food stores? Yeah, lack of food stores. So, um, okay. yeah. So one thing I, again, tried this year. I've seen it done. I've just never had done it, never had to do it. Um, if you are low on food and or you know, your, your hives are low, um, I'm doing this on several of my hives right now. It's called the mount, mountain camp method. Mm -hmm. And basically you take a shim and I, I made the shims that I have on, on my hive. Um, they're not hard to make. It's just, you know, four pieces of wood. And um, some people put a small entrance on them as, you know, the smaller picture you see down in the corner has a, a an upper entrance that you could use. But uh, um, 
you put that on there, it gives you some space between the top bars and the inner cover. And you put some newspaper down. I'm using, um, uh, oh, what's the paper you cook with? Um, oh, parchment, parchment paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm using parchment paper and you just dump the sugar on top of that. Now what that does a couple things that I like, you know, it feeds the bees, but then it, it also helps to absorb some of the moisture in the hive. Oh. So if you have moisture issues, that also helps that. Um, so that's called the mountain camp method. It's quick, it's easy. Um, the, the sugar does need to be um, hardened or, or you know, made into a candy-like substance before they can actually take it, consume it. But um, if you just put it on top of a parchment like that, the moisture in it, it'll, it'll absorb moisture in the hive and it'll be fine. I haven't had any issues with it. My bees are eating the heck out of it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, the other method is uh, it's called the candy board. Um, and again, you can make this mm -hmm. or you can buy it. I think the one on in the, in the picture, the one on the left hand side is something you actually purchase people sell. Um, I, I'm kind of cheap and I like making it if I can. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so they um, they make they mix sugar and I'm not sure what else they put in there, water. Um, sometimes they put honeybee healthy in there and they make this, this solid crystalline, they call it um, candy and put it in there and, and put that over the bees. And that kind of does some of the same things. It helps absorb some of the moisture in the hive and feeds your bees at the same time. So either of those are an option if you need to feed I mean, if, if, if you, some of you have honey frames around, um, nothing beats natural honey, but if you don't, which I don't think a lot of people do, then mm -hmm. um, this is the next best option. And then number, th go to three. Three. Um, I don't know if, if how many of you are familiar with this, but uh, if you go into your hives and you see a lot of uh, mold, you know, if you're a first year beekeeper, you probably haven't seen it yet, but come spring, if you haven't done anything to mitigate the moisture in your hives, you're going to see mold on some of your frames, on your honey frames. Um, and that's due to this excess moisture inside the hives. Some, some people, you know, the, the, the bees will clean it up. Um, but sometimes that excess moisture can harm the bees. And um, that graphic here just shows you how, where the moisture comes from. So you have the bees down below, they, uh, you know, they're creating heat. Um, that warm air rises and hits the cold outer cover and condenses and then kind of rains back down on the bees. And uh, I think you already talked about the, the different methods that you, you know, the moisture quilt or the um, just insulating your, your, your cover lid mm -hmm. so that you don't get that con condensation. Sheree, I know you have those plastic mm -hmm. insulated covers. Those, those, those seem to work pretty well. They do. So the those plastic, um, I love those plastic ones. And part of it's because in the summertime, they, they tend to absorb less heat, I think. Mm -hmm. And they're super yeah. lightweight. They seem to be really extremely durable for what you pay for them. I think they're, they're, they end up being about 30 bucks, maybe a piece, but um, I really like those lids. Uh, what I do, so in the winter is I basically have my two boxes and then I have my, I leave my inner cover on, the inner cover with, you know, just a little, it has a little spot in the middle of the, um, the wood, right? And then on top of that, so that's on top. And then I have a, a super, just the box itself that I place on top of that and then have the lid. And um, for whatever reason, we're, we're there with my highs are located. They, it seems to work well. I have tried the, um, um, I have tried using the, the pine shavings, that kind of thing, but it really, there hasn't been that much moisture that I've needed to do that. Um, at least where the highs are located right now. And what I like is I can actually take off the inner cover um, or I'm not the inner cover. I'm sorry, take off the telescoping lid and I can peek in and that's where I will put um, my, my sugar candy, sugar 
board things, right? And I did try making some at home. So what I did is I took some regular granulated sugar, right? Not, and not anything special. Um, you add a little bit of water and you just basically toss it. And then I, I ended up adding some dry, um, dry um, feed in there with it. And I did try to lay it out on a, um, on a cookie sheet, you know, and then let it dry overnight, but it wouldn't stay. I don't know if I wasn't using enough moisture or what, but it wouldn't actually stay as a block. So it ended up being in pieces, right? Yeah, it takes but, very, um, very little water. Yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe I was using too much then. So it, um, but I put that in there and the bees just, they've been, I can tell it's, it's, and I think that's the big thing. If you're getting into beekeeping, as just as a reminder, always have at least two hives to start out with. And the reason for that is it gives you at least a comparison. So it's been very interesting to see which bees are taking that sugar, those sugar pieces more quickly than others. Um, and then I actually have a third spot, which is outside of the hives, kind of adjacent to the apiary, where I've used just a, a plastic bucket and I'll put a couple of handfuls in there for them to grab. And, um, and so, Anyhow, long story short is it's actually worked out pretty well. Um, and uh, just, and it was just an extra layer of just making sure that they had enough to eat to get through the winter. So, um, so, but with the moisture, I was telling everyone earlier that there's always one corner of the inner cover that gets a little bit mold just on the edge. And I can tell that that's where, you know, that's a low point. So otherwise they're pretty, pretty, pretty closed up. So has anybody else um, had, has, and I know we have people from different areas, a couple of people from Volcano and around, you know, different parts of the valley. <laughs> has anybody else had, um, had an, any problems with moisture, especially on those really foggy days that we've had? Has anybody noticed more moisture? Hi, um, I'm Anna. And hi, I, Anna. Hi, <laughs> my bees are in Volcano. And what I have noticed now is that I believe mold is um, growing on the on the base. Oh, so oh. That, that's something that I'm going to have to probably check, you know, once the, the weather gets warm. But yeah, other than that, I have it up in mind, my high. When you say when you say base, you mean the bottom board? In the, the very bottom, bottom yes. like the floor of the hive. Yes. Okay, hmm. yeah, that's not too big of a deal. I mean, that's moisture. If the moisture's you don't want, you want it dripping down the sides if it's going to drip. You don't want it dripping down on top of the bees, but uh, um, you might get in there and just check to make sure your bees are dry. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Mark, do you have anything to add? I know I, I heard him earlier. Oh. Let's see. He might be trying to unmute. <laughs> you the one thing too that they always recommend is definitely not to feed the liquid feed in the winter so if you are going to feed that's why a lot of people use that granulated sugar and that's just because um i did notice more uh, i think my first year of beekeeping i did try to feed um the the two to one syrup during the winter in my jars and i did notice more moisture so that's why i, I moved away from that and just went with the with the granulated sugar so, um, so sometimes that, even that simple thing can help um, eliminate some moisture out of your hive. So, oh, there we go. Mark's on. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Sorry, I had my phone unmuted, but the uh, Zoom app wasn't. So I was here chatting away. <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, gosh. Yeah, so where, where I'm at, where a lot of us are at, it's right on the valley floor here in, in Lodi, right around all the orchards and a lot of vineyards. And even as a kid, I remember growing up here, it's all about fog in the morning. So if you're up at like four in the morning, there's no way you're getting away from that moisture. It's in the air, you're breathing it. Same thing in the hive. There's gonna be a ton of moisture and those uh, quilt boxes are overwhelmed in a matter of like probably an hour. So. You know, at some point, there's just what you can mitigate and what you can't. You know, you do your best job. Um, make sure you have enough bees in there to do the job is really more than anything. Um, 
a hive with barely any bees left by now are going to have a heck of a time changing their environment at all. Uh, but a hive that's full of bees right now won't even care. So uh, there's a lot of that, you know, population size. Not, a, not much you can do right now changing population size uh, except for combining hives, and I would only really do that if you think there is a chance one of them isn't going to make it. So as far as moisture, yeah, there's a heck of a lot you could do uh, if you're really worried, but you might find out that it was in vain mm. um i'd say you're, you're probably okay with the moisture i think more than anything is lack of food lack of food right now as we're getting closer towards the period where flowers will come out means this is the last the last sprint that you're going to need to make during the no food period um and that after that, once we get into mustard or any of the earlier ones, uh, you'll be fine. Those hives will start bringing in food, and you'll see they'll start to increase in size. Uh, the only thing I would remember right now is that we're having a warm spell, but our coldest month for our area is not December in any fashion. Our coldest months are usually towards the end of January, the beginning of February. I mean, it's a little weird, but that's those are our coldest months. When we start to have hard frost that's always a surprise for everybody when we get to about the end of january so um i would think about the next couple of weeks not just what's going on right now because i'm i'm at that knee-jerk reaction where i want to feed a lot of syrup right now because it's so warm but um i'm looking ahead to see if there's any cold days because then the bees won't touch it they won't touch it if the syrup's yeah. too cold so yeah. that's that's my big rant. <laughs> so you're, <laughs> Good Mark, deal, Mark, Mark. You're, you're getting ready to take hives into almonds, right? Yeah, very soon. Um, it's, it used to be you had to have them in by February 1st, <laughs> but now it's more like February 15th. Okay. It seems that almond, almond bloom doesn't seem to happen as early as it used to, mostly the varieties. It's, it's those self-pollinating almonds. That's what's doing it. <laughs> we can blame it if you want to. <laughs> um, no, they used to have a lot earlier uh, varieties. Now those are just the pollinator, and you really don't need the bees in there yet until the main variety is there. So um, if you see that striped situation going on the freeway, you look at some almond trees, and you see one row is in bloom and the next row is not in bloom at all, that's because the first one is a pollinator variety, and it usually blooms a little earlier different different variety mm -hmm. got, got. so i think we had a couple of questions i'm going to go ahead and just stop sharing is that okay and then um we had a couple of questions that come that came through on the chat so let me let me go ahead and find those here um so the first one first one was from from anna and um she's up in volcano um, and she says right now her um, her bees are the boxes are wrapped with insulation after the first snowstorm, and she's seen some of them flying in and out of the box. And she was wondering if it was safe now to remove the insulation, or if she should wait a little bit longer. And I think, I think for now, I think I would wait a little bit longer. There's there's a thing called fall spring, and that's what I think we're feeling this week, where you know we're getting kind of this little glimpse of sunshine, and we're like, oh my gosh, things are starting to bloom and turn green and and we're ready to like jump out there, right? But um, but I think it's it's we we know from our experience and from history and weather <laughs> that we this is what always happens, right? We get kind of a false spring, false sense of security that the sun is out, and and before we know it, it's going to be freezing again. We're going to have some more rain. Um, what's that saying? April April showers bring May flowers. So we know that between January, February, March, you know, there's there are going to be some um, some weather variants that'll that'll make it a little bit challenging. And I think even just the last two years, I'm trying to remember, we got, I want to say that we got some rain kind of a little bit later, but it just seems like everything kind of throws it off, right? So um, where we're able to, you know, we're kind of, we think that we're ready for spring and then it, it switches up on us at the last minute. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, everybody else agree? 
I don't know that Volcano even really gets that cold where you have to insulate the hives up there, but it, it, you're not hurting anything by doing it, I guess. Um, and, you know, leave them on there. Again, you're not hurting anything mm -hmm. if you just leave them. So there's no... Yeah. It's not like they're going to get overheated. <laughs> yeah. So just leave them on. All right. All right. So let's see. What else do we have? Um um, another question was, um, do you always add um, a nuke or does it depend on how strong your hive looks now? So, because I think early on, Paul, you were talking about um, adding on a nuke, a nuke box. Uh, if strong. Yeah, I don't, I'm not adding a nuke. I'm basically, basically that's just a bank for a queen. So if something happens to a queen in one of my other hives, let's say I have an aged out queen queen dies, whatever, I can go to that nuke. I can take that queen out, put her in a queen cage, put her in the hive where I need a new queen. Mm -hmm. And then um, I just start over with that nuke. So I'm, I'm not adding the nuke. I mean, I guess I could, if I have a hive that needs numbers, I could combine that nuke with another hive and, and build the strength up. But mm -hmm. the, um, the intent is that, it, that I have a queen there available if I should need her in, in one of my other hives. Got it, got it. And then um, Melissa, Melissa was asking who everyone's going through to get their nukes. And I think there's a good chance in February we'll probably devote some time to just how do you pick, right? What's the difference between a nuke and a and um, and a package of bees? And I know it's something that we'll definitely be covering in our beginning beekeepers class. Uh, that's on March 5th. <laughs> so make sure you sign up for that. Um, and then, of course, so our guild for the first time is going to be offering, we're going to be arranging to reserve nukes and bring them down the hill from Grass Valley so that people don't have to make it all that way and have them have be a local pickup. But we're only getting 20. Um, this is our first time kind of bringing these down for guild members. So, um, so people will have an opportunity. But really, you want to go through someone, um, when you're getting your nukes, just real quickly, you want to go through someone reputable, um, and you want to ask a lot of questions, right? One nuke A is not always the same as nuke B. And you want to get what you pay for. Nukes are not cheap. Um, buying bees is not cheap, right? It, it can be expensive. So you want to make sure that you're getting what you pay for and, and ask a lot of questions. Make sure you understand what it is that you're buying. A nuke is generally um, defined as an established nucleus colony. That means there's a queen that's already been in there for I don't know, a minimum of, I don't know how many weeks, but they're, they're showing every, every cycle or every part of the brood cycle. So you should see larvae, you should see eggs, you should see capped brood, and you, and you should see a nuke that's, that's thriving and growing. It just hasn't gotten to the point where it's filling up a whole box yet, right? So an established nuke. And you want to make sure that queen's in there, that, they're, that they have been laying, and you can see that in that nucleus. Sometimes you will find um, some beekeepers that will be selling, like they're trying to package up a nuke, but it's, they've just added the queen and they've really, it's just a package that happens to be in a box um, with frames <laughs> instead of a package of bees. So, but we'll learn more about that in the beginning beekeepers class and probably next month as well. Yeah, it's hard when you're just starting out and you don't have the experience with, right. you know, mm -hmm. what's available, who's available. Um, mm -hmm. I think I've been doing it long enough, I have a pretty good idea. You know, there's people I like, there's people I don't like. Right, um, right. So, um, but you can't go wrong with Eric Oliver and the Oliver nu Nukes. Um, they are very good. You know, they know what mm -hmm. they know their stuff, obviously. Right, exactly, exactly. But the key is that now's the time to order those. Now is, now is when um, other bee clubs are taking their orders as well, or when, um, different places are offering their bees. I know that the, um, 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 oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking now on their names. Um, is it Oliveris? Oliveris up in Orland, mm -hmm. up near Chico. They are taking their orders, I think, for their packages right now, but they are not doing a hobby day, unfortunately. So uh, they usually do a hobby day in April and, and they've um, decided to, to pass on that again this year. Um, but they basically have one day where everybody comes up to Orland to pick up their, their package bees. Um, let's see. I want to go through here some more, some more questions. Um, let's see. So, um, 
So Dave says, so do not pour the sugar on the paper. Um, and I think there is some truth to that. I think if you were desperate, you could, but what happens is the bees tend to, if it's just poured in the, on paper and put in the hive, the bees tend to carry it off. Is, is that right, Mark and, and Paul? Carry what off? The sugar. They'll I actually take it out. I haven't, I haven't had, had that experience. Happen. Oh, you haven't? I haven't, okay. no. I put the parchment paper down, put sugar, and I that's been fine. It's been that way for yeah. several months now. Yeah. Good. Yeah, what what uh, what usually happens is there's so much moisture again, like we talked mm -hmm. earlier, that the dry works great because all the moisture gets sucked up by the um, the sugar, not to really reduce the the moisture as much as you think, but it turns it all into candy on its own. So it oh. makes a nice little crust out of it. Yep. The bees, yeah. if you watch, you'll open it one day and they're they're on it a little bit. And then they slowly start eating the pile from one side to the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it's all gone one day. Mm -hmm. So um, I usually say, if you're gonna use newspaper though, use like two to three sheets on top of each other. I mean, you can make them small to fit whatever size, but that way, you know, it's not so thin that it falls apart. Mm -hmm because you don't want that sugar to fall back down through and onto the bottom board. It's just kind of messy, but yeah. um, I've used, even used whatever I had, you know, I've used a little tiny piece of cardboard. <laughs> I've used um, parchment paper, wax paper, a uh, square of <clears throat> tin foil. It really doesn't make a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. um, I just wouldn't spend money on it, you know? So whatever you got newspaper, like I said, Absolutely. But it seems to well, work really well. Now, um, uh, Ed, Ed Corpas here, it might be Barbara, <laughs> asked, well, how do you make, how do you make hive candy and what's, what's dried feed? So I had mentioned earlier about, I mixed in some dry feed in with my, uh, my, when I was attempting to make my own, my own uh, sugar candy. So what it is basically is it's, it's pollen patties, but in a dry form, right? A pa it's very powdery. Um, and it was just thought, I thought, oh, I'm just gonna try this. I'll add it in there. And it was one that was a little higher, um, higher protein, I think. But it was, um, anyhow, you basically, what I did is I took a gigantic bowl or, or big tub and poured granule, just regular plain granula, granulated white sugar from Glasgow in there. And then I added um, just a little bit of water enough to make it stick together. It sounds though that I might've added too much water. Um, and then I, but I did add I just a little, maybe half a cup or something of the, of the yellow um, dry feed. And then I basically put parchment paper on a, you know, on a cookie sheet, kind of, you know, patted it all out, made sure it was all down and patted down and then let it dry. So that was my technique. I, I mean, it was okay. It was my first year really trying that. Has anybody else made it? And, and what have they found has worked or not worked? What's their favorite method? Just if, if you do a search online for no, no cook candy board, oh, yeah. you'll find all kinds of recipes. Cooking it, be, if, I you don't, don't recommend doing the cooking. Um, and Mark can explain the whole chemical process. But <laughs> cooking sugar, if you get it too hot, creates chemicals that are no good, no bueno. Um, Mark, what's the long word? You like saying it. Hydromethyl sure for all. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody else want to attempt to say that? <laughs> but I, I can post on, um, somebody just posted a, a recipe on, on another website that I saw today and I can, um, later this evening, I'll post that on the, the, the uh, Big Valley Beekeeping page. Oh, very good. So let's see another question. So Rachel asks, what do you do to clean a hive? Can you, can you even clean a hive, right? Um, or do the bees clean it? And that's what's kind of cool. So the bees really will do most of the cleaning for you. Um, what I've learned is that, you know, if I'm getting like, for instance, used equipment, um, I'll, I have one of those, you know, portable blowtorch things. So, you know, I'll burn kind of the inside of the hive boxes, that kind of thing. If I want to sanitize. Um, the biggest thing is just knowing where that equipment comes from, if that's the case. But, um, but Typically, if you have, if now, if you have frames of that, maybe wax moths got to, the biggest thing you're going to, you know, the most important part of that is putting them in the freezer. You're going to put them in the freezer for at least two to three days. 
um, which will kill the wax moths. And then you can go through and kind of pick out, you know, every, all the yucky stuff that they've left behind. But by all means, you can definitely put those back in um, to be used again, because the bees will clean those out. So anything, anything to add on that part, as far as cleaning, cleaning boxes or frames? <coughs> I don't know. Oh, and then um, let's see here. Um, let's see. Oh, here we go. My um, one person would like to know, their daughter wants to know how old do you have to be to guild, be a guild member? You can be any age. <laughs> Yeah, um, even the 4 Hers can be um, guild members as well. It's just $20 for individual or two people in the same household. It's $30 for a for calendar year membership too. Um, the, the website is being redone so that you can do that all on the website. And, and uh, yes. it'll be set up where you could do a single, an individual or a family mm -hmm. membership. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. And then... Um, uh, let's see, quarter posses. They say, I have a whole case of pollen patties. Can I use that instead of the dry feed? I don't think they recommend using poly pat <clears throat> pollen patties this time of year, but you can definitely keep them in your freezer and keep them fresh for next, for the spring and the summer. Yeah, the, the issue with pollen patties is the, the pollen is what, what kind of drives the hive, you know, in combination with other things. Uh, daylight temperature but one of the things that um when they get protein that mm -hmm. they then have the material they need to start producing uh brood and if you, you get a, a big hive full of brood too soon too early um a there's not going to be enough bees to keep it warm and you know you're going to get this hive explosion before anything becomes available for forage and that's that's the main reason it's kind of discouraged this time of year. You can buy winter feed. Um, I, I would say don't waste your money. It's it it's looks basically... it looks just like the granulated sugar stuff that I made. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's and that's that's basically I was like, all of it. Oh, yeah. yeah. I thought it was kind of funny. I was like, oh wait a minute, they they already thought of that and they're selling it yeah, and packaging it all up. <laughs> it's got much way less protein in it than uh, the regular stuff. Yeah. Oh, and, and then Jessica Hansen actually has a fantastic tip, which is that if you make your own sugar candy squares, make sure that you cut it before it dries. So there you go. Score it out before it dries. Um, so that'll help too. All right. I did post a recipe on the, in the chat. Oh, yes. That, that was the one I, I, somebody recommended or posted today. Got it. Got it. Make sure you keep that too. So let's see. I'm looking at the time. It's about 7.30. Um, hopefully that helps with everyone's, um, you know, thoughts about just how to, what am I looking for in my hives right now, right? And even if you don't hives, have hives or bees yet, um, this will help you kind of prepare for next January and, and get used to the weather cycles that come through. Um, but we still have a few more minutes. So if anybody would like to go ahead and unmute themselves, if anybody has any questions, just in general, um, that they would like to ask, um, we we're definitely can take a few questions right now. Hi, is it still safe to feed them um, the sugar candy right now? <laughs> yeah, 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 I'd say so, Paul. Yes. Yeah, there's no, it, if they don't want it, if they don't need it, they won't take it. So there's no harm done. You're not. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I have some, I have some trees out kind of adjacent to my house and they were all, I was going to post a picture. I'll probably do that. The bees were all over that this week and they have like, it's the tree that has little tiny pine cones, but it has right now it has all of these, I don't want to call them blossoms, but they look like strings kind of dangling. And the bees are all over those. So anybody else, are they finding that their, um, that their bees are on specific plants or trees right now? Since it's warm. Um, if you have palm trees they should, and, and they're blooming, they're gonna be all over those. Oh, that's awesome. Come at this, uh, my eucalyptus was blooming not too long ago. They were all over that. <laughs> Oh, very good, very good. 
Let's see. Oh, um, let's see. So someone, let's see, has asked if making your own spacer, this is probably a question for you, Paul, too, or maybe even Dave Marson um, also makes his a lot of his own equipment, too. If making your own spacer is two inches tall, high enough. Oh, plenty. Yeah, plenty. Yeah. You could, an inch and a half would be more than enough. Oh, there you go. Okay. You know, go, go to the store and, and, you know, lumber comes in certain sizes and you know, save yourself some work, you know, find something <laughs> that's close to the right size and use it. Oh, there you go. Good deal. All right. So who, I'm just curious. So how many of you do not have bees yet and are planning to get your first bees this spring? You can raise your hand, like, or you can put it in the chat, or you're welcome to unmute yourself too. Yeah, I don't have any bees. I'd like to find out how to get them. Oh, good deal. Actually, Hi, I'd Jeffrey. Like find out. Hi. I'd like to find out how to start from the beginning. I've already got some um, some hive, some uh, boxes, and uh, I'm making a place for the bees, and uh, and I've ordered them. Um, to, to come in, they said they were going to be in like March or April or something. I don't know. Um, and then, uh, but I need to know, you know, step by step what to do. I mean, it's fun to listen to you guys that are already doing it. I'd like to find out how to <laughs> do step by step, you know, from, from the beginning. You're in, you're in Valley Springs, right? I believe I, I kind of think we chatted a little bit the other day on Facebook. Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, I am. I'm on the, uh, um, I'm up in the, what do they call it? The Rancho Calaveras Rancho area. Calaveras. And, okay. Do we know anybody in Valley moved. Springs, Sheree? Well, we know um, the Olsons. They're <laughs> 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 yeah, on the other I, side I, of I, you, though. I, I, I met you on Facebook. Oh, okay. That was you, huh? Yeah. Okay, well, I just... I just moved up here, like I said, so, you know, I, I'm, you know, still trying to get the house in order, let alone, you know, the place for the bees and everything. So uh, it's a little bit overwhelming. I don't, uh, I don't know anybody. Um, you know, I've always done uh, my horses and I've, uh, you know, surfing, rock climbing, all these other things. And now I'm going to start something with bees. And, and I, I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to have a mentor. Or, you know, I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to have somebody <laughs> teach me how to do this from the step by step, you know. But yeah, yeah I, we'll um, see. I hopefully it'll go well. I can help you. So, I mean, did you, did you order or your, your nukes already? I, Thank you. I have a, uh, oh, go good. Yeah. I, I, I don't know who I ordered them from, but I have a, a okay. guest house. So, if you'd like to stay here and help me out, <laughs> I'll let you stay here for free. <laughs> and feed I, me. Jeffrey, I thought. I thought you told me you you already ordered them from Eric Oliver. I did. I I, I don't remember um, exactly who from. I'd have to look things up. But, okay. But um, I'm supposed to get two nukes, um, and I'm I'm uh, and I, I hope that's the right thing to do. But I, you know, I want to have them, a place for them to stay. You know, I know that I've got two boxes, and one has like a little extender on it, and I've got some screens and some openings and uh, um, some tools and I've got a, a beekeeping, you know, outfit, but, you know, it'd be nice to know how to use all that stuff, you know, so. Mm -hmm. So definitely, uh, Jeffrey, I would definitely want you to, to enroll in our beginning beekeepers class. <laughs> we'll have the links up next week, I think, oh. but um, you should, it's yeah, definitely I, worthwhile I, to come on down for that. And then El Dorado I, beekeepers, they're also offering a, be a beginning little, beekeepers class. They might be a little bit advanced for me but we'll see <laughs> <laughs> it's okay but it, it but i think you know i know for myself i've mentored with someone i before i even got my bees i spent about two years just um hanging out with another beekeeper and just to kind of get familiar get you know comfortable with the bees my father had kept bees when i was just a little child and so i remember going out there with him but um but beekeeping there's definitely a high learning curve to a certain degree but it's super fun and that's yeah, the exciting well, part of it, right? Is that you're constantly yeah, learning. I heard, uh, <laughs> when, when I heard uh, you, that there was a young lady that was asking about how old you had to be to be a big valley beekeeper in the uh, in the guild, um, mm -hmm. it reminded me of I was a little eight year old kid, and, and the kid, the people across the street um, had all these you know great orchard and stuff. We um, 
climb up on the roof and you know pick their plums and stuff like that and um but they were in 4-h and they were doing that um they were doing mm -hmm. beekeeping and they had bees and i thought like, oh, how cool is this you know they even had a a little one frame hive that you know sat on the table in their in their living room um with a, a hose that went out to the um, outside and so you could see these bees working and stuff. it was just fascinating it's just amazing so <laughs> i'd like to get into it yeah no definitely very good. Well, I'm glad you found us. And um, and it looks like we have another question in the chat too from Rachel. She's asking, is it bad to get a swarm or are they nice or better? And it, it all comes down, it depends on the swarm. <laughs> um, swarms are not really the most reliable way to get bees, but they can be. Some people have gotten really good at it. Um, I, I, it I wouldn't re recommend relying on a swarm no, right, just right. to start. Um, you know, approach this as if you'll never get a swarm, order some right. bees, and then um, if you hear of one or you get into catching swarms, um, I think, do we, are we going to do a swarm catching class or, or meeting? We, we might, we might, we might make that specialty for maybe members only um, as one of our member perks. And then we also have a swarm list so if you're interested in learning how to catch a swarm um, or being on that swarm list, which means that you get a call when a swarm becomes available, because um, we get contacted from different groups throughout the county that say, hey, I got swarm, you know, I got some bees in my in my yard. Um, so if you're a member, we'll actually add you to that list. If and a lot of times in the beginning, um, we'll we'll try to partner up. So because we want people to learn how to catch the swarms as well. And so you'll be able to kind of tag along with someone and learn how to learn how to catch them, which is kind of cool. Oh yeah, and Dave Morrison, he mentions in his backyard. Dave Morrison, he's our newest director and he has a backyard. He, I hope it's okay, Dave, I'm gonna just say it. He lives out in Stockton and he's in an urban environment, right? And his backyard is notorious for catching swarms. And he can set out a box and bait it and bees will move in. And it's 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 pretty miraculous. <laughs> Cause I've been trying that for years and it hasn't worked <laughs> out where I am. But um, I have a and then, house like that in Sacramento. I, I caught mm -hmm. 10 swarms at one house. That's amazing. And that's the thing people, you know, if, if there's um, people don't always realize that swarms will go back to the same spot. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, if you, if there is a certain yard and they go to always the same tree, you don't want to cut those branches, right? You want to actually leave them there so the bees will know where to go to. So, um, and then, oh, can a swarm be more wild or aggressive? It really depends on the bees um, and how long they've been there, right? So normally if you hear about a swarm, you want to capture it within the first two to three days at the most. Um, and, and so, because they do kind of engorge themselves before they leave and they head out into the wild blue line yonder <laughs> for a new for a new home. Um, so I have encountered both really mild uh, swarms as well as kind of aggressive ones where it was I'm like, okay, you're not supposed to <laughs> you're not supposed to be this upset. <laughs> um, and then also um, looks like Matthew is asking what kind of bait is it lemongrass oil? And some people do use lemongrass oil or there's even products you can buy. Um, or you can use old brood comb is a huge bait for them too. So DW from Blue Green Horizons, I'm hoping maybe he'll be willing to speak with us this year. Um, he talks about creating what's called a scion, which is something where that you can actually hang and, and help attract bees to it. So if you do get a swarm coming through your yard, then you help create kind of create that opportunity for the bees to land on it. Makes it much easier to actually re then relocate the swarm from that branch or that, I don't know, the, the scion to your actual hive box. So Paula, you've caught a lot of swarms. Is there anything you would add to that? Or what do you um, use as bait? I use Swarm Commander, but uh, Swarm <laughs> Commander has lemon, lemongrass oil in it among other things. Um, so, so I, my preferred, uh, method is to use the, the swarm commander. It's not cheap, but it doesn't require a lot either. So, um, you know, one bottle will last you a couple of years. 
That's pretty good. Um, so that in combination with a uh, with old comb, um, and and I my swarm traps have five frames in them. Only I usually only put two frames in there that have the old comb in them because they're basically the queen is looking for a safe safe haven safe place to go and that those two frames provide that and then um, placement of the the swarm the box is important you don't want to put it in uh, where it's going to be in direct sun because it, let's say a swarm moves in the sun hits it, it gets it gets too warm they'll leave okay. so put it put it somewhere out of the sun got it got it and then just uh, Rachel, so the person that we referenced, his name is DW, but his website is called Blue Green Horizons. And we might try to post the link to his site in the, in the chat. Um, but he does, he specializes in um, more kinds of swarm captures that involve more construction. So um, very kind of more in depth, highly skilled. He goes in, he runs a nonprofit as well, but he's out of Sacramento. And he will, um, if you have a, a swarm of bees that have moved into a, the siding of a house or into structures, that kind of thing, he'll, he actually has a team that will go out there and, and help remove them. So pretty amazing stuff. He has some great pictures and very, very knowledgeable. I was trying to talk him into buying a 75 foot boom truck yesterday and he wouldn't go for it. <laughs> he, could, he would be the one that could use it. Yeah. Oh goodness. All right. Well, with that, let's see. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, our, we were so appreciative, so glad that you're here. And thank you for joining us tonight. Our next meeting, we always meet on the second Thursday of every month, is going to be February 10th, I believe. Um, and we'll let you know, we might end up doing that in person, um, as well as streaming it online. Um, we're going to talk again with the Village, Village Cafe on Lodi Avenue in Lodi and see if they'll welcome us back. Um, the really cool thing about that place is that you can come in, you can order dinner, they open up just for us. Um, and so we try to patronize them by, you know, at least ordering <laughs> dinner or some dessert. And then we have our meeting and then we've been attempting to do the streaming video online as well. It'd be a little tricky <laughs> to do both at the same time, but we've made it work. So, um, but that's our plan. But please, in the next Next week or so, please watch your email, watch the Facebook page. Uh, we will have um, the links on to join and become a member in 2022, as well as for reserving your new boxes and um, signing up for our beginning beekeepers class. So, all right, anything else to add, Mark or Dave or Paul? Well, if anybody has any questions, you know, whatever, something we talked about tonight, if you know, think of a question later, just post it on the, um, on the Facebook page and we will, there's, there's always people available and, and willing to answer questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, happy new year, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you next month. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you.